So the next practical consideration that we want to take a look at is the nature of the impulse train that we've been using for sampling. So in all the math that we've been working through so far, when we've performed sampling, we have taken the continuous time signal that we want to sample, and we have multiplied it by an impulse train. So this impulse train has periodically spaced impulses, and these are true impulses, infinitely small width and infinitely small height, such that when you integrate across the impulse, you get one. So it has a density of one. Now, in reality, we can't ever generate anything that is like this because we can't generate signals that are infinitely thin and infinitely tall. So in practice, what would we probably try to do if we wanted to kind of emulate this sampling behavior? We would end up using something more like this middle picture right here. If I wanted to sample this continuous time signal x of t, I would multiply it by something that kind of looks like an impulse train. It still has the periodic spacing. But these pulses don't have infinite height, they have finite height, and they also have finite width. In performing this multiplication, where I'm multiplying my continuous time signal by my pulse train, I still kind of accomplish my goal of ending up with a signal that has been sampled in time. Instead of having values kind of everywhere in a continuum of time, I now only have values at these discrete points in time. So I've still accomplished my goal of sampling the signal, but the question is, if I have something like this, can I still get back to my original signal? All the math we've done so far, like I said, has used an impulse train that's perfectly, a perfect impulse train. Here in this picture, though, I've used something that's different. So what we need to do is we need to work through the math and ask ourselves, if I sample a continuous time signal x of t with this more practical pulse train to result in a sampled signal that looks like this, can I still recover the original x of t? Or is this practical sampling different somehow? It is definitely different. It's different in the sense that I'm no longer using a true impulse train, but it still would be nice if I could go from this sampled signal back to my original signal. So that really is the question we have to answer now. Can I perfectly reconstruct, which is what we were able to do with the impulse sampling, right? If I did impulse sampling, we worked through how I could go from those samples back to my original continuous time signal x of t perfectly. So can I do the same thing here? If I sample with finite width pulses, is it still possible for me to perfectly reconstruct my original signal from the sampled signal? So to answer that question, we're gonna kinda do this in two steps. In the next video, we'll work through kind of the general theory of what I call practical sampling. And having worked through this theory, we're gonna conclude that yes, we can perfectly reconstruct a signal if I've sampled it with some type of practical periodic signal. And then after we work through this general theory in the next video, then we'll work through a very specific example. We'll actually take this theory from the next video and we'll apply it to a very specific instance where we actually work with a specific pulse train, a specific signal, etc. So those are the next two videos. This video does the general theory, and then we take that general theory and use it in a very specific case.